Was the Roman Emperor Caligula really insane? He committed incest, murder, and other acts of insanity while running the empire into the ground and bankrupting it in less than four years. Or so we're told. But almost everything we know about Caligula comes from hostile sources writing decades or centuries after the fact. And the popular portrayals of Caligula as a raving lunatic abusing the levers of power depends on our blind acceptance of those same sources, even when they contradict each other and the available archaeological evidence. But a different picture emerges when we read the sources more critically and take advantage of all the evidence. And I think that more accurate portrayal of Caligula and his reign, with all its nuances, complexities, intrigues, and conspiracies, is much more interesting than the oversimplified, lurid depiction of Caligula as a madman that's become so entrenched in popular culture. And before we dive in, this is not to say that Caligula was a great ruler or a good person, but the evidence does suggest that Caligula was probably a better administrator than we've been led to believe. And defining just about any Roman emperor as good or bad is, well, it's complicated. This is gonna get pretty granular, but my goal here is to build a case and let you be the jury. The prosecution has already had its say in movies, books, and countless clickbait articles. So I'm gonna ask you to hear all of the evidence, weigh it carefully, and then make up your own mind. If we don't have an accurate understanding of Rome's third emperor, then there's a hole in the foundation of our knowledge of early political power, of public opinion, memory, and censorship. But then again, all of that assumes that Caligula was sane. Vain, arrogant, and cruel, Caligula was probably all of these things. But let's see about insane. We have just a handful of sources for Caligula's reign. Caligula was born in AD 12, and he ruled from 37 to 41 when he was assassinated. Part of the challenge with trying to get an accurate picture of Caligula's reign is that there's just not that much written material from that time that survives down to us. And the writing that does survive presents a whole host of problems. Most of the more lurid and depraved tales of Caligula's reign, along with the loudest claims of insanity, come to us from just two sources. So let's take a look at our best known source for Caligula's reign. His name was Suetonius. Now, was he an eyewitness to the events that he describes? <laughs> no. Suetonius was born around 80, 70, and lived to 140. Suetonius was not a senator, but he was friends with many senators. Suetonius probably wrote about Caligula circa 120 AD, so we're talking about almost 80 years after Caligula was assassinated. Even though Suetonius was a prolific writer, not much of his writing survives other than his famous The Twelve Caesars. His book The Twelve Caesars starts with the life of Julius Caesar and then finishes up with the life of Domitian. Naturally, it also includes the reign of Caligula. There's just a few problems with Suetonius. The first of which is that he's been compared to a gossip columnist rather than a historian by modern scholars. And other scholars have even compared Suetonius to a magpie. He just can't resist any juicy or salacious story or a little bit of gossip or an anecdote, no matter how questionable the source or how contradictory the story might be. Suetonius also has the interesting habit of taking one event and using it to generalize a whole pattern of behavior. Now there's evidence to suggest that Suetonius is using some different sources in Greek and Latin, but the problem is he doesn't cite any of his sources and it's hard to figure out where he's getting some of his material from. The thing with Suetonius is that he wasn't interested in writing history as we think of it now. He wrote thematically rather than chronologically, and he often has the habit of shuffling different events and happenings around to better suit his method and themes. So Suetonius is upfront about this. He essentially says, here's this emperor's family tree, here's a whole bunch of good deeds they did, here's a whole bunch of bad things they did, and now let me wrap it all up with some personal characteristics and a little bit of moralizing. Now this robs the modern reader of vital context, but Suetonius assumed that most of his readership would already be intimately familiar with the events and lives that he was describing. Before we move on to other sources, let me pull just one example from Suetonius' Life of Caligula that illustrates the problem with accepting the author on pure faith. Suetonius writes that Caligula was very embarrassed that his grandfather was Marcus Agrippa. Agrippa was a great general, administrator, and the well-respected right-hand man of Caesar Augustus. But Agrippa was not of aristocratic birth. So given Agrippa's popularity and obvious competence, Suetonius seems to be setting up Caligula's lack of respect for him as the perfect example of the mad emperor's poor judgment of character. The problem is though, it doesn't seem to be true that Caligula was actually embarrassed of Agrippa based on other evidence. If Caligula was so embarrassed by his grandfather's lowly origins, then why did he commemorate him on coins throughout his reign as emperor? Likewise, Agrippa's name and lineage are proudly inscribed on a funeral urn of Caligula's mother. And they're also inscribed on a pedestal that once was home to a statue of Caligula's mother. And later in Caligula's reign, a personal acquaintance sent the emperor a letter in which the accomplishments and judgment of Agrippa, his grandfather, are notably praised. And again, this letter was meant to be conciliatory with Caligula. Do those actions sound to you like those of a man who's embarrassed by his grandfather's origins? And later on, Suetonius will criticize Caligula 
for not caring enough about the family backgrounds of the people who he surrounds himself with. So enough about Suetonius, let's move on to our next source. Next up is Cassius Dio. Dio was an aristocrat living in Nicaea in what is now Turkey. Was Dio an eyewitness to Caligula's reign? No, but Dio's father was a senator and a consul, and Dio himself was a senator and held the consulship in AD 222 and 229. So he's writing almost two centuries removed from Caligula's time. Dio wrote a huge history of Rome, starting with its origins and then wrapping up naturally with his consulship in 229. A good chunk of it survives, including the portion that deals with Caligula's reign. Dio's not that good on names and dates and things that we think are pretty important in modern history, and he also has a tendency to embellish and exaggerate when it suits his purposes or when it makes for a more dramatic story. He also likes to do the same thing with the motives of the historical persons that he's writing about. Does Dio cite his sources? Not really, and it's really hard to see where he's getting his material from too. So are there any biases or sentiments that might negatively color Dio's portrayal of Caligula? Well, Dio's not a big fan of the common people of Rome, nor does he have very much affection for the Praetorian Guard, and Dio is very concerned with how the emperor comports himself in relation to the Senate. And you could also say that Dio is abundantly proud of being a senator. As we'll see later, Caligula's main antagonists were the Roman Senate, and his main sources of support were the army, the Praetorian Guard, and the common people of Rome. So that brings us to Josephus. The Jewish historian lived from roughly AD 37 to AD 100. So he too was writing decades after Caligula died. Thankfully, Josephus wrote a very detailed account of Caligula's assassination, which is most notable for its creativity, moralizing, and inconsistencies. J.P.V.D. Balsden, an author of a biography of Caligula, said that Josephus was essentially useless for his study of the life and times of Caligula. That's not to say that Josephus isn't an important writer and very valuable on a whole bunch of other topics, but when it comes to Caligula, Josephus has his own biases. Josephus famously wrote The Jewish War, which described the rebellion of the Jews in AD 66 and the subsequent war that dragged on with Rome. So that gives you some idea of how bad relations got between the Jewish population and the Roman rulers. Relations between Imperial Rome and the Jewish population, they got pretty bad during Caligula's reign too, and for that he definitely deserves some serious blame. But we will talk more about that in some detail later. Seneca, the great writer, philosopher, and senator, was a contemporary of Caligula and knew him personally. So being a contemporary should make Seneca a much more reliable source, right? I should probably point out here that Seneca was exiled shortly after Caligula's death for having an affair with one of his sisters. And on top of that, Caligula was actually very well schooled in Latin and Greek literature and made a point to criticize and make fun of Seneca for his writing style. And if you know anything about writers, that's a surefire way to make an enemy of one pretty much for life. So there's a chance that when Seneca writes about Caligula, his accounts might be tinged with a hint of personal bias. Seneca absolutely uses terms of madness to describe Caligula, but Seneca also uses those same terms of madness to describe Alexander the Great. There is an ancient tradition of associating madness with tyrants and the inability to control one's appetite, whether we're talking about sexual lust, the lust for drink, the lust for power, or greed. The mad tyrant is something of an ancient trope, so we need to keep that in mind. Now we have Philo of Alexandria. He lived from 30 BC to about AD 45. Philo actually met Caligula. He was part of a Jewish delegation that met with the emperor during a period of extreme tension and strife between the Jewish population and the Roman state. He didn't have a whole lot of love lost for the Roman Empire or the emperor himself. Philo essentially concludes his writing that's called the Embassy to Gaius. He concludes that piece by saying, and this is why the Jews hate Caligula. So fair enough. Philo's meeting with Caligula didn't go well, but there's nothing in his account of it to suggest that Caligula was insane. Busy, sure. Disinterested, absolutely. Even annoyed, yes. But nothing that suggests madness as we think of it. Philo's account, though, is invaluable, and we will absolutely revisit it in some detail later on. Now, what about Tacitus? Tacitus is generally a more reliable historian, but the problem is the portion of his annals that would describe the reign of Caligula doesn't survive today. So in Tacitus, we have some mentions of Caligula, but nothing substantial that would be very helpful for our study of him. So it seems pretty clear then that we need to be careful about accepting some of these sources' claims of insanity and acts of lunacy. Caligula was born at the end of his great-grandfather Augustus's reign and grew up during the reign of Tiberius. So if we're gonna make sense of Caligula's life and his rule as emperor, we need to understand just a little bit about what was going on with Augustus and Tiberius. By the time Caligula was born in AD 12, many Romans would have had no memory of any other ruler besides Caesar Augustus. 
Augustus was in his 70s then, and had been in charge since 27 BC. This incredible longevity allowed Augustus to leave behind a legacy and popular memory of him as a subtle, respectable statesman. But in the wake of the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, Augustus was still known as Octavian, and he was described as a young thug and a violent warlord by ancient writers and modern scholars. There's a tendency to categorize Roman emperors as good and bad, but even the good emperors could be cold-hearted, brutal, and murderous. Part of it was the nature of imperial Roman power, and part of it was it was a matter of survival. So a quick look at the rise of Augustus will give us some perspective when judging some of the other Roman emperors. After Julius Caesar was killed, Octavian, later to be known as Augustus, teamed up with Mark Antony, and together they made a list of political enemies that was hundreds long. I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, just for the sake of speed. In any case, the victims were Roman aristocrats, and their estates and their money were confiscated. In many cases, the victims' severed heads were brought to the retinue of either Augustus or Antony, so that the killer could get a reward in return. The thing is, though, Augustus was a skilled propagandist, and because he lived for so long, he was able to put some distance between himself later on as a statesman from his initial bloody rise to power. Anyways, that's not where the brutality of Augustus ends. Augustus is said to have had the son of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra put to death. Augustus also attempted to legislate morality while overlooking maybe his own indiscretions. At the same time, that didn't stop Augustus from exiling his daughter and granddaughter for adultery and vice. Then there's a long list of marriages that Augustus compelled and political enemies who were either exiled or executed. And if we're to believe Suetonius about some of the most brutal tales of Caligula, then why shouldn't we believe Suetonius when he describes some of the brutality of Augustus, like the time Augustus gouged a man's eyes out with his bare hands? So in the writing of Suetonius, we find Augustus committing no shortage of cruel and violent, brutal and shameless acts. But when it comes to the reign of Augustus, we have some other sources that we can look at. So how did Augustus actually rule Rome? This is really important because the system that Augustus set up is gonna be one that Caligula has to live up to, or at least negotiate his own peace with. When we call Augustus Rome's first emperor, that gives the idea that Augustus was ruling by imperial edict, but the reality of the situation in Rome was a little more complicated than that. In his biography of Caligula, Alois Winterling sums up perfectly the situation between Augustus and the Senate. The Senate had to act as if they wielded power they did not have, and Augustus, for his part, had to pretend like he did not have the absolute power that he did in fact wield. This was a delicate but necessary balancing act. The Senate was a body of roughly 600 men whose family names were inscribed on monuments around Rome and were synonymous with Republican liberty and great deeds, mythical and otherwise. These were proud, wealthy, well-connected men. And until just a few decades ago, they'd gotten used to a system in which the best among them basically took turns running Rome. The ultimate achievement for a Roman senator had always been to become a consul, which was the highest office. Being one of the two consuls elected for the year was a big deal. It meant that forever after, that year in Rome would be known as your year. The Romans kept track of time by saying, oh yes, of course, that happened during the year of Marcus so-and-so and Gaius so-and-so. So Augustus allowed the Senate to debate and convene and keep up the pretext that this was an advisory body that actually mattered. In which case, Augustus would make sure to subtly hint at the desired outcome or appointment he wanted the Senate to arrive at. Not surprisingly, the Senate often arrived at the very outcome that Augustus had desired and hinted at. So while we call Augustus Rome's first emperor, Augustus himself referred to the office as princeps and made sure to position himself as first among equals or first citizen. And at first, Augustus lived in a house not much nicer than that of a well-to-do senator. He kept his imperial entourage small and he rejected certain honors and just tried to generally keep up an appearance that wasn't too out of line with that of a well-to-do senator. I'm oversimplifying a bit here, but Augustus kind of humbled himself rather than elevated himself. But despite Augustus's long rule, there were going to be two huge problems that his successors would face and that Augustus could not solve. Number one is Rome's aristocracy hadn't really gotten used to the idea of solo rule. They'd gotten used to the idea of Augustus's version of solo rule, along with his manners and his subtleties, his personality, and his way of respectfully interacting with the Senate. And the second problem is Augustus never really solved the problem of succession. He had no son of his own, and with few options late in his life, Augustus had to appoint his stepson, Tiberius to be his heir. During the Julio-Claudian era, the nearest male heir was in theory the next in line, but it often didn't work out that way due to bad luck, illness, uh, sudden deaths, or violent palace intrigues. So the issue was solved by adoption at times and the appointment of a non-hereditary heir. In theory, that meant 
A more qualified person could be appointed to be the successor, but it often didn't work out that way. And the drawn out process that many emperors went through in terms of trying to find that next successor often incentivized jockeying and violent palace intrigues. So the legacy that Augustus left for his successors was essentially a tightrope. Augustus was a political genius, and yet even he could have fallen victim to the system that he had created many times. There are a number of plots against Augustus during his lifetime, but they were typically quashed during the early stages because Augustus had an effective security apparatus and had loyal lieutenants and people he could really trust around him. And yet, during various points of Augustus' reign, he was concerned enough about his safety to wear armor into his meetings with the Senate. So before we get to Caligula, there's just one more question we have to ask and answer. How did Tiberius, the next in line, do with the system that Augustus had set up? Caligula's uncle Tiberius was 55 years old when he succeeded Augustus in AD 14. Tiberius had been a good general, but his serious disposition and temperament and experiences were probably better suited to military life than they were navigating the complicated relationships of the Roman political system. Tiberius either lacked the patience or the ability to keep up the act that was established by Augustus. And unfortunately, the Senate expected Tiberius to keep up that same pretext that Augustus had. So here's the essential problem of Tiberius' reign. If Tiberius openly expressed his directives and wishes, then all that remained was for the Senate to agree with him, which then made it apparent that the Senate was more decorative than influential. Perhaps unintentionally, Tiberius was saying the quiet part out loud. You senators don't really matter anymore. But what if Tiberius swung the other way and was more opaque about his directives and wishes, which he often was later on in his life? Well, in that case, the Senate would convene and debate and arrive at a conclusion and have a 50-50 chance of incurring the wrath of Tiberius when they got it wrong, which again, for Tiberius to get what he desired and his directive carried out, meant illustrating the lack of power and influence that the Senate really had. The result in Rome was an almost unbelievable amount of paranoia, flattery, and double dealing as Roman senators vied for the emperor's favor and tried to divine his wishes and what was going on in his head. The senators tried to divine the emperor's wishes, but just as often, they ended up denouncing and accusing each other of plotting against each other or the emperor. There were constant accusations and treason trials under Tiberius. Nearly any senator could be denounced and brought up on charges, whether there was any evidence of conspiracy or not. Tiberius even allowed slaves to bring charges against their masters, which given the households that most senators kept, meant that they had to be very careful about everything they said even in their own homes, or else they would risk a slave overhearing it and reporting it to one of the officers or advisors of Tiberius. Things deteriorated to the point where Tiberius, partly out of fear for his life, withdrew from Rome completely and moved to the island of Capri. The same atmosphere of paranoia dominated on Capri, and it only got worse as Tiberius aged and his mind gradually deteriorated. Things got so bad that Tiberius resorted to ruling through an intermediary, the head of his Praetorian guard, who was named Sejanus. Sejanus was a power-hungry conspiracy architect who worked behind the scenes to dispatch rivals and advance his own cause. And some of those rivals that Sejanus went out of his way to get rid of were Caligula's family members. Now, let me know in the comments if you're interested in a video about Sejanus because he's a very interesting dude. He rose from relative obscurity to become one of the most powerful men in the empire. No sooner had Sejanus risen to the apex of his power than he fell victim to the same treason trials that he himself had profited by. It's hard to imagine a more toxic, paranoid, double-dealing atmosphere than the court of Tiberius at Rome and then on Capri. And on Capri is precisely where Caligula spent his formative young adult years, essentially as a hostage of Tiberius. So how did Caligula end up living with Tiberius? Caligula's dad was an absolute rock star. His name was Germanicus, and he was a wildly popular general. Although, to be fair, some of his popularity was probably due to the James Dean effect. Germanicus was a handsome, charming, and competent general who died young under semi-mysterious circumstances. But Germanicus was a pretty popular guy in his own day too. Before his death, Augustus compelled Tiberius to adopt Germanicus, even though Tiberius had his own heirs. There's a sense that Germanicus was the anointed one and that if he could only rise to become the emperor, he would do an excellent job administering the empire. So Caligula spent his childhood toddling around after his father. He became a mascot in the Roman legion camps because his mother dressed him up as a little soldier. And that's where his nickname comes from, Caligula, which means little boot or little boots. After Germanicus got done campaigning in Germania, he went on a world tour of the provinces, kicked off by a triumph in Rome. And at that triumph, where Germanicus rode through Rome, past an adoring public in a beautiful chariot, Caligula was next to him in that chariot, soaking it all in. When Germanicus and his family visited the eastern provinces, they were greeted and treated almost like gods. Egypt, Greece, Asia Minor, and then finally Syria. The reception for Germanicus 
and a young Caligula who was just six or seven years old at this time was incredible. As a Roman general and governor, Germanicus was basically a king to the people who were living in the provinces. Then in AD 19, Germanicus got sick in Syria and died surrounded by his family. He was just 33 years old, and he'd been loyal to the emperor Tiberius to the very end. The legions of Germania had once offered Germanicus to depose Tiberius for him and acclaim him the new emperor, but instead, Germanicus had turned down the offer and harshly suppressed that mutiny. On his deathbed, though, Germanicus claimed that he was poisoned, and rumors abounded that Tiberius had something to do with the death of Germanicus. People said that Tiberius was threatened by the incredible popularity of Germanicus, and that's why he had something to do with his death. But there's no evidence that survives to today that points to Tiberius' involvement with the death of Germanicus. But Germanicus' wife, Agrippina, she didn't see things that way, and she reacted as though Germanicus had in fact been poisoned by Tiberius. Now, before we go any further, it should be pointed out that the death of Germanicus was an event in the empire. The whole empire grieved. They grieved to the point where Tiberius issued a decree that said, hey, cool the guys with all the mourning. It's not like an emperor or somebody died. So when Agrippina and seven-year-old Caligula made it back to Italy, they were greeted by throngs of mourners. For the next several years, Caligula bounced from household to household while his mother Agrippina tried to maneuver Caligula's older brothers into positions of power with disastrous results. Caligula eventually moved in with his grandmother Antonia. She was the daughter of Mark Antony and she had been around imperial politics for a while and she was probably able to teach Caligula a thing or two about navigating imperial courts. Now at the same time, Agrippina was at the court of Tiberius, again trying to advance the causes of Caligula's brothers and maneuver them to a point where maybe they could be the next emperor, but she did it without almost any tact whatsoever. She could not refrain from expressing her conviction that Tiberius had had something to do with Germanicus' death and had then marked her family for complete destruction. But by the time Caligula was 14, one of his brothers and his mother had been arrested for conspiracy and declared enemies of the state. And not long after that, Caligula's other brother was also arrested for treason, possibly on false charges. Before Sejanus himself was executed for conspiracy, he and his faction and friends played a leading role in taking out members of Caligula's family. When Tiberius summoned Caligula to live with him in AD 31, Caligula was 19 years old. His oldest brother was dead, either starved or suicide. Caligula's mother was living in exile, and Caligula's other brother was rotting in a Roman dungeon. But even so, Caligula's family remained popular with the Roman public, and they even went so far as to protest the treatment of his family. But as Caligula made his way to Capri, he had to know there was a target on his back as the next most logical successor. Caligula and his three sisters were now essentially to be hostages of Tiberius, and they would be surrounded by the very same people who had victimized their family. Almost immediately, Caligula learned on Capri that the eyes and ears of Tiberius were everywhere. You had to be very careful about what you said. A single murmur of sympathy for his brothers or his mother might be overheard by one of Tiberius's advisors or even a slave, and then reported to the emperor as an act of treason. For the next roughly six years, Caligula essentially had no confidants and no allies he could trust, other than his sisters. When his mother died in exile in AD 33, Caligula couldn't mourn. She was an enemy, a traitor. It would have been disloyal to Tiberius. Same thing happened when Caligula's other brother died of starvation in prison. Caligula was being tested by mentions of his family members, and his reactions were being scrutinized for any evidence of disloyalty to Tiberius. And yet, Suetonius uses Caligula's seeming indifference to the deaths of his family members as clear evidence of Caligula's early insanity and lack of humanity. But for Caligula to mourn his family at the court of Tiberius would have almost certainly meant imprisonment or worse. But interestingly enough, as soon as Caligula became emperor, one of his first acts was to retrieve his mother's ashes from exile and bring her back. So for Caligula to survive on Capri took cunning, patience, and long-term planning. These are not characteristics of an insane person, I would argue. Even the ancient sources admit that Caligula was a brilliant student and a very gifted speaker. And Caligula gained a great deal of approval from Tiberius in this way because one thing that the old emperor respected was education and learning. Now, to solve the problem of succession, Tiberius appointed his grandson Gamellus and Caligula as joint heirs. But up until the moment of his death, Tiberius refused to give the nod to either one of them. But Gamellus was just 17 years old when Tiberius died in AD 37 and Caligula had started to strike up a friendship with the new head of the Praetorian Guard. His name was Macro. Caligula was assisted by Macro, and there was some sort of intrigue, but for as many sources as there are, there's just as many different versions of what happened after Tiberius died. One version even says that Caligula played a role in speeding up Tiberius's demise. Another says that Macro did. It's not clear quite what happened, but Philo tells us that if Tiberius had lived for just a little longer, Caligula would have likely fallen under suspicion and maybe even been killed himself. Supposedly there were some allegations about to be made against Caligula, but it's not clear if there's any substance to those charges. Huge celebrations in Rome greeted the news that Caligula, the son of Germanicus, 
would be the new Roman emperor. Caligula was just 24 years old and was seen as the darling of the people. Now, one thing to point out here is that by the time of Caligula's accession, Rome had gotten used to being ruled by old men. The age of entry for the Senate after the Augustan reforms was 25 years old. There would sometimes be exceptions for certain members of the nobility, like Caligula himself, but it's safe to assume that the average age of senators was much older than that entry age. So just think about today, how different the worldview is between someone in their 20s versus someone in their 40s or 50s. And we're not even talking about something as complicated as a question of how to govern a big chunk of what was then the known world. If the age discrepancy between Caligula and the Senate was the only problem that the emperor had faced in dealing with the senators, that probably wouldn't enough to cause some serious friction. But the friction from that age discrepancy was just the icing on a cake of conspiracy past intrigues and old feuds. As emperor, Caligula would be in constant contact with the Senate and imperial magistrates, of which many had spent the past decade keeping treason accusations against his family, or at least nodding along in agreement at their trials. So much of Rome's aristocracy expected Caligula to take revenge. So what did Caligula do after becoming emperor? Caligula ended the conspiracy trials that had become so common under Tiberius and victimized so many of the Roman aristocracy. He even burned the records from those trials under Tiberius in the forum for the public to see. Caligula was trying to establish a clean slate. Caligula then gave a speech to the Senate in which he called himself, the emperor, their ward and son. He promised more open communication and he would do his best to emulate the great Augustus. The Senate was so blown away that they decreed the speech should be read every year. It was partly out of self-interest to make sure that Caligula held up his end of the bargain, but it was also partly because they were so relieved that what had happened under Tiberius didn't seem like it was going to happen again. When Caligula was informed of a conspiracy against him shortly thereafter, he just laughed it off and promised not to persecute the accused. As Caligula put it, he'd been in charge for such a short time, how could he have done anything to offend anyone? Clearly, these accusations must be lies. Just like Augustus, Caligula turned down many honors, and he asked to be respectfully addressed as a leading citizen. Given his background, Caligula made sure to increase the pay for the soldiers, he increased the pay for the Praetorian Guard, and he handed out large sums of money to the Roman public themselves. He bestowed honors on his family, living and dead, partly as an effort to restore and rehabilitate their official reputation. Legends and hero worship had grown up around Germanicus, Caligula's dad, so this was a very popular measure with the Roman people. And Caligula even adopted Tiberius's grandson Gamellus as his own heir, and this was seen as a very beneficent act. Caligula then gave an open accounting of his and the empire's finances. Now at the time, the lines between the emperor's personal wealth and the imperial treasury were a little blurry. This opening of his accounts, though, was not required by law and was generally hailed as a great step forward and a big step for transparency in his rule. So the ancient writers all agree that the beginning of Caligula's reign was excellent. What they don't agree on is when he went bad. Depending on which ancient source you look at, could be eight months in, could be a year in, or it could be two years in. So let's talk about what happened eight months into Caligula's reign. Caligula fell seriously ill, like practically on his deathbed ill. It's not known precisely what afflicted Caligula, but it was so serious that the public was holding vigils and basically praying that he might somehow live. While Caligula was on his sickbed, he named his favorite sister, Drusilla, as his heir. That would have effectively made Drusilla's husband, Lepidus, Caligula's successor. So with Caligula looking pretty ill, Macro, the head of the Praetorian Guard, and Silanus, a senator, started getting the next in line ready, which would have been Gamellus, Tiberius's grandson. The only problem is they got Gamellus ready a little bit too soon and a little too vigorously, because then Caligula recovered. The public rejoiced, but not the imperial court, and especially not Macro. Caligula decided that he could no longer trust Macro. Dude was just a little too quick to get that successor ready. Macro had effectively turned Gamellus into a threat too. Gamellus was forced to commit suicide, and Macro and several other senators were charged with treason. Silanus himself was demoted and then committed suicide. After that, Caligula then turned once again to the example of Augustus. Rather than have one head of the Praetorian Guard, Caligula made sure to appoint two men to jointly share power and hopefully counterbalance things to make sure neither one of them got too ambitious. He'd clearly seen what happened with Sejanus and Macro and how that position could be exploited. Suetonius writes that Caligula never really recovered from his brain sickness, but the wheels of government kept turning and Caligula seems to have continued on as a pretty able ruler. Caligula eliminated the sales tax, he threw lavish games, he created new pathways for new men to reach the equestrian order and the senate. He gave senatorial judges more power to decide cases, in theory, speeding up the courts. Caligula also built new aqueducts and a port that would supposedly better help facilitate the grain trade in Rome. Taken as a whole, Caligula's early policies seem to have benefited the population at large more than the aristocracy. Of course, unlike Augustus, Caligula had villas and palaces built that were very lavish and luxurious, and he showed less patience for the republican forms of flattery and friendship 
that had prevailed under Augustus. So instead of playing that game, Calusa spent more time enjoying the actual games and entertainments of Rome, which he was roundly criticized for by the Senate and by our ancient sources. And yet here's the thing, the Roman public loved that Caligula loved the same entertainments they loved, because one of the main complaints about Julius Caesar was that he would write or read or work through the games that he attended. In Tiberius, he didn't even attend the games, which was very unpopular with the Roman people. Caligula even went so far as to reinstate elections, which was a nod to Republican values and virtues. This was supposedly what the old guard families of Rome's aristocracy wanted. But the senators gotten so used to essentially holding closed elections and appointing whomever they wanted to whichever office that they didn't actually like this because it was gonna cut into some of their corruption and crime. The return to elections also meant that Rome's aristocracy would again have to curry favor with the general public, and they weren't terribly interested in doing that. This policy barely lasted a year, did not go well, but it did highlight the hypocrisy between the Senate's expressed values and what they actually wanted. And then after a period of relatively stable rule for almost two years, all of a sudden in AD 39, there's a wave of treason trials, executions, and charges inflicted upon the Roman aristocracy. At least that's what Dio says. But unlike in the past, Actual trials were held. Charges were filed against a number of leading senators. There was a conspiracy, and it involved those that Caligula was specifically trying to accommodate. This wasn't an old grudge being settled against the family. This was a profound rejection of Caligula's rule. Caligula gave another speech to the Senate, and he laid into them for their double-dealing, false flattery, and general hypocrisy. Caligula even said that if Tiberius was such a bad and terrible ruler, that the Senate should not have honored him. They should not have flattered him. Caligula essentially said, Let's bring it all out into the open. You hate the emperor no matter what he does. You pay lip service to Republican values. You claim to flatter me and say nice things to my face while you plot my death behind my back. After this point, Caligula dropped his Augustus act. It's almost like Caligula said, if you're gonna treat me like an autocrat and plot behind my back, then I'm gonna rule like one. So the ancient sources condemn nearly everything that follows as the result of Caligula's madness. But I think when we look at things in context and we pay attention to the chronology, what follows looks a lot more like a cruel and prolonged revenge than it does as evidence of insanity. But again, you be the judge. So let's take a look at some of the most famous events from Caligula's reign that people like to point to as evidence of his insanity. So Caligula had a bridge of boats built in the Bay of Naples that was almost three miles long. He then had a road constructed on top of it so he could ride back and forth across it. This event was chalked up to madness by both Suetonius and Dio, and Suetonius goes so far as to say that there was no purpose to this at all. Caligula just rode back and forth for no reason. So that sounds pretty crazy, but Suetonius can't resist contradicting himself because after he says that there was no purpose to this event, he then gives three different explanations for what Caligula was really doing. Perhaps Caligula was trying to outdo Xerxes, or maybe he was trying to strike fear into the hearts of the Germans or Britons, both of whom thought they were safe because a body of water separated them from the Roman Empire. Dio too admits that there was some purpose to this event, but he can't quite decide what it was although he ends up deciding that it was something like a mock military triumph. So what really happened? Well, for starters, it would be very helpful if there was even a consensus as to when exactly Caligula built his bridge of boats and rode back and forth across it. There are some who say that this happened after Caligula's abortive military campaigns in Germany and Britain, which would place that in AD 40. You might have heard something about an incident with some seashells. And then there's others who say that this event actually happened before Caligula left on military campaigns in Germany and Britain. So I wanna go with the consensus here, which is based on a reading of Dio, and say that this happened before Caligula left on military campaign. But regardless of the actual order of events, there's something close to agreement as to what was probably going on here with Caligula's bridge of boats. It seems like this was some sort of military spectacle, either meant to set the stage for a triumph or to take the place of a triumph. So for simplicity's sake, Let's take the consensus argument and say that this bridge of boats was built in 39. The tensions were very high between Caligula and the Senate. Now, in hindsight, we know that there's actually a conspiracy brewing. And remember, Caligula had just chastised the Senate for their two-faced behavior and their mistreatment of the Emperor Tiberius. So let's take a little bit closer look at what actually happened on that bridge of boats. So on day one, Caligula rode a horse across the bridge. He supposedly wore the breastplate of Alexander the Great and was decked out almost like a god. And as he went across the bridge, Caligula was accompanied by a large number of soldiers and members of the Praetorian Guard. And Caligula's fourth wife was there too, right by his side, and she seems to have been dressed in the costume of a goddess to match Caligula's own. So on day two, Caligula rode back across the bridge, but this time he was in a chariot. And this is significant because that chariot makes this feel very reminiscent of a traditional Roman triumph. 
and it would have looked a little bit like the triumph that his father Germanicus celebrated when he returned to Rome. Just a spectacular parade with an adoring public and pretty much everyone just singing the praises of the conquering hero. But halfway across the bridge, Caligula stopped and gave a speech to the soldiers who were gathered there. He thanked them for their service and he handed out bonus payments to them. This was a huge spectacle and drew tons of attention, but there was one conspicuous absence. There were no senators or high-ranking imperial magistrates there. This is significant because Caligula with this spectacle, this display with the Bridge of Boats, he seems to have boxed the Senate out from their traditional role in awarding the triumph. It's kind of like uh, when the Emperor Napoleon crowned himself. Caligula is basically saying, I don't even need you to award me the traditional spoils and triumphs and ovations of the empire. I can do that myself. So if we take a closer look at that speech that Caligula gave and those bonus payments that he's handing out to his soldiers and Praetorian Guard, this suddenly looks like a very public display of the affection and loyalty between emperor and army. The senators would have clearly seen that Caligula still had a lot of support and the emperor's supporters were well-armed and tough soldiers. And not only that, Caligula had very publicly just reminded the soldiers and Praetorians about who was responsible for that financial well-being. Tiberius had done something very similar when he was emperor. He'd had the senators accompany him on a trip outside the city walls to where the Praetorian guard camp was. And then Tiberius and the senators had watched those soldiers during their training exercises. And again, the message was clear. Look at these tough, battle-hardened warriors who are loyal to me specifically. So when Caligula did go on campaign, he made sure to take a portion of the Praetorian Guard with him, just driving home that link between the Emperor and his men. So the next episode of Insanity that people like to cite is actually connected to that bridge of boats. So Suetonius tells us that Caligula liked to parade his fourth wife, Melonia Caesonia, around naked for his friends and associates to see. And perhaps even worse than that, Caligula actually displayed his fourth wife in military dress, which was possibly an even greater affront to conservative Roman sensibilities. And reading Suetonius, it's almost as if the ancient writer can't quite decide which is worse, him displaying his wife naked or him displaying his wife wearing Roman military dress. Now here's the thing, Suetonius tells us that Caligula loved his fourth wife too much. And this is clearly meant as an insult. Now this was actually a common Roman insult and had often been leveled at Etruscans and then was later often thrown out at Romans who were of Etruscan descent. In some Roman circles, loving your wife too much was actually seen as a failing of character. So I think this point perfectly illustrates the problem with trying to judge ancient persons through modern eyes. By which standard do we judge them? The ancient one or by ours? Anyways, we're also told that Caesonia is actually kind of rather plain. And Suetonius lists this among her many faults. Suetonius also tells us that she's not young, she's got three daughters already, and she likes extravagant and luxurious things. Now this is interesting because earlier on, Suetonius criticized Caligula for his impetuousness and shallowness in marrying a woman based solely on her great reputation for beauty. Never mind the more likely reason that Caligula was desperate in his first marriages to find a wife who would help him produce a legitimate male heir for his own safety and Rome's. But in any case, it seems that Caligula's last marriage might have actually been one of genuine affection. Of course, the explanation that Suetonius gives for Caligula's affection for his wife is that she drugged him with a love potion. And somehow, to Suetonius, this is further evidence of Caligula's madness. Clearly, we're on solid ground here. There's no reason at all to doubt the tale that Suetonius is telling us, and especially not his interpretation of Caligula's feelings toward his fourth wife. The writer Dio also acknowledges that Caesonia was a trusted confidant and companion of Caligula, and she was always by his side, even on the bridge of boats, apparently. And here, at least to the modern biographers of Caligula, it seems that Suetonius is likely generalizing based on one event. So did Caligula display his wife in armor? Yes, he did, but it seems like this might have been one instance that was then generalized to a whole pattern of behavior, which doesn't seem to have been the case. What's interesting about Caligula dressing his wife in armor is the armor that she wore. So based on descriptions of what Caesonia wore, David Woods, a University of Cork uh, classicist, he makes the convincing argument that Caesonia is meant to symbolize the goddess Venus Victress. Venus Victress was believed to have accompanied many great Roman commanders into war and aided their victories, among them Sulla, Pompey the Great, and Julius Caesar, who Caligula was descended from. And during Caligula's time, Julius Caesar was actually the last Roman general to have crossed the English Channel and set foot on Britain. So paired with the festivities that accompanied the Bridge of Boats, it seems more like what's going on is an elaborate display of symbolism designed to channel this great goddess and the idea of the great military victories of Rome's past. 
Now, granted, this clearly challenged the norms and mores that the Roman aristocracy preferred, but that might be beside the point. Looked at in detail, this starts to seem more and more like a canny bit of propaganda rather than an act of madness. Although to an extent, there weren't really that many norms for a Roman emperor to follow. There just wasn't that much precedent one way or the other. Now, I should mention before I go on that the ancient writers also claim that Caligula used so many boats to create this elaborate spectacle that this actually caused a famine because there weren't enough boats to bring the grain into Rome. But I'm not sure what to believe as far as that goes. Clearly, if Caligula caused a famine with this spectacle by taking all the boats, that would be pretty crazy. However, it seems to go against what we've been told previously about Caligula. We were told that earlier in his reign, he spared no expense to build a much better port specifically to facilitate the import of grain into Rome. It seems strange to me then that you'd spend a great deal of money and labor to build new ports with the express purpose of bringing grain into Rome more easily, only then to take all the boats and then create a famine by preventing the trade of grain. And in my research, I couldn't quite find anything conclusive one way or the other. This again seems to be another place where there's not a great deal of consensus. Is this a case of exaggeration, confusion? It's hard to tell. And again, the chronology is so confused that it makes it even more complicated because there was a famine that happened, but it's hard to tell if we can actually tie it to the specific events, i.e. the bridge of boats. So keep that in mind, I don't have a firm feeling one way or the other on this event, but let's move on to the next story about Caligula and his wife. Did he display her naked for his friends to admire? Now, I don't want to be crass, but if Caesonia was pretty plain the way Suetonius described her, this seems rather confusing. But perhaps Caligula was just blinded by love and saw something that the others didn't. Or perhaps Suetonius has misunderstood his source, as Woods argues very persuasively in another journal paper. This doesn't necessarily seem out of character for Suetonius. There's at least a few instances of places where he's misinterpreted or mistranslated things. So in describing this display of Caligula's wife, Suetonius uses the adjective nudus. This Latin word actually has two meanings, one of which means naked as we would normally think of it, and the other means naked as in without arms or armor. So there was likely some sort of gathering or party after the bridge of boats, and Caligula and his wife both appeared there, without their costumes and without their armor. It seems like our mystery source might have been expressing some sort of relief given the context, and it would have been very important that he could now note that she was naked, as in naked without arms or armor, and thus was no longer offensive to the conservative Roman sensibilities. Caligula left Rome with a section of the Praetorian Guard in an absolute frenzy. Apparently Caligula was just suddenly struck with the idea of a military campaign and left rapidly. Maybe he needed more Germans for his bodyguard, or maybe he was just crazy. At least, that's what some of the ancient writers tell us. But it seems what really happened is that Caligula was informed of a massive conspiracy that included members of his inner circle and a general who was posted to the legions in Germany. Caligula naturally had to speed up his plans to prove his worth as a military commander and quash this conspiracy before it got out of hand. Winterling gives an excellent account in his biography of Caligula, but here are the broad strokes of what happened. By this time, Caligula's favorite sister Drusilla was dead. It seems that after Drusilla was gone, Lepidus then had an affair with Caligula's other two sisters. Lepidus and Caligula's two other sisters were at the center of a plot that included the commander of the German legions, many Roman senators, and other high-ranking officials in Rome. Gaetolicus was an incompetent but generally well-liked general because he was very lax in disciplining the soldiers. This military commander had been under suspicion since the reign of Tiberius because he was a known associate of Sejanus, that scheming praetorian who we talked about earlier. So Caligula took Lepidus with him on his march north, not betraying any knowledge that he was aware of the plot. The rapid march and sudden frenzy to leave was designed to catch the German legions off guard. Caligula did not want to risk a mutiny against him. It seems to have worked because Gaetolicus was arrested and executed shortly thereafter. But before he died, he named names and confirmed what Caligula already knew. Lepidus was next, Caligula then exiled his sisters, and even Ptolemy, the king of Mauritania, was eventually implicated and executed for his crimes. The guilty parties were some of Caligula's most trusted allies, confidants, and family. And it was during this same period that the writer and philosopher Seneca supposedly fell afoul of Caligula for giving too brilliant of a speech. But modern scholars have pointed out that Seneca was known to have been in association with Sejanus while he was still alive, and would have been in close contact with the remaining members of that faction. So when we look at this sudden march north, it seems like there was more of a purpose than we were told initially. In between rooting out conspiracy and starting his first military campaigns, Caligula spent the winter of 80, 39, 40 in Gaul. And what did Caligula do while he was up there? 
He apparently had some massive auctions of imperial goods and furnishings. And the ancient sources vilify Caligula for having to stoop so low to sell imperial goods and furnishings at an auction. But given the context, this looks like an effort to raise funds for his military campaigns and probably to liquidate the estates of his sisters. In Gaul, the goods would have been especially attractive to the new moneyed aristocrats who would have seen anything from Rome as having a little bit more cachet. And it should be mentioned that decades later, Pliny the Younger, writing by the Emperor Trajan, praises Trajan for having the fiscal prudence to sell off unneeded and unused imperial goods and furnishing at auction. As evidence of insanity goes, the imperial auctions seem pretty weak. Now almost everyone has heard of the famous incident of the seashells. Caligula marched the Roman army to the English Channel and then commanded his men to pick up seashells as spoils of war. This one sounds pretty crazy. For starters though, it's not even clear whether this happened at the English Channel. Suetonius's writing on this event is vague enough that some scholars have argued that this actually took place along the Rhine rather than the English Channel. I think there's something to those arguments, but we don't really need to get into them here. Regardless of where it happened, it seems what's far more likely and what many scholars agree happened is that the legions refused to cross whatever body of river it was and confront the enemy. And after the Roman legions balked at a direct order from their emperor, Caligula punished them by telling them to pick up seashells and declaring that this would be the only spoils of war they would get because of their cowardice. So it seems like Caligula was absolutely enraged by this flagrant disregard for his orders, at which point he initially wanted to decimate the troops, but backed off that initial anger and once he calmed down, decided to merely punish them by having them pick up seashells. They wouldn't be getting any gold or silver or whatever riches lay in Britain because they were too cowardly to go there and confront the enemy. Now, why should we believe this more rational interpretation? If it happened in Germania, those legions there had gotten used to the lax discipline and the relative ease of camp life there and hadn't done much in the way of their training. And a campaign would have no doubt made sense to Caligula as a solution to that problem of discipline because his father Germanicus had solved a similar issue in Germania during his lifetime. And no doubt those stories would have been told to Caligula throughout his life. Now, what if this happened on the Channel Coast? Is there any reason to believe that the soldiers might not obey a direct order? At this time, Britain was the edge of the known world. It was shrouded in legend and inhabited by fearsome barbarians, at least to the Roman mind. Just three years later, when Emperor Claudius, Caligula's successor, launched a military campaign in Britain, his soldiers mutinied and refused to cross the Channel and go fight. It took weeks for Emperor Claudius to reassert control over the legions, put down the mutiny, and get them to cross the channel. In any case, I think it's clear that Caligula had assumed his greatest support in Rome lay with the legions and especially the ones on the frontier. He probably thought that some of the reflective glow of Germanicus would still shine on him. But instead, on his efforts either in Britain or in Germania, he found that there were limits. And when he found those limits, Caligula flipped out. But Caligula did not have time to wait around like Claudius did. He punished the troops and had to leave immediately. During Caligula's march back to Rome, a small group of senators met him on the road and told him to hurry back. There was further unrest growing among some of the other senators in Rome. Caligula had three sisters, and it's commonly cited as fact that he committed incest with all of them. Suetonius makes this accusation. So it's very interesting that Seneca makes no mention of it himself. Again, Seneca knew Caligula personally, and he even had an affair with Caligula's sister Lavilla. And Seneca absolutely hated Caligula, so there's no reason to think he would suppress an accusation or a rumor if he thought it would be believed. Philo of Alexandria also moved in Roman aristocratic circles, and he too makes no mentions of this claim. So it seems very strange then that Suetonius, writing decades after Caligula died, would have some sort of special line right into the imperial bedrooms. But then again, Suetonius levels charges of incest at other emperors, including Augustus. Attacking the bedroom habits of Roman emperors and leaders was a common tactic of discrediting them. The frequent marriages, divorces, adoptions, and political unions of the Roman elite created very tangled family trees that were easy targets for mockery. Caligula even joked about his own tangled lineage, saying that his mother was the result of incest between Augustus and Augustus's daughter Julia, who had three different spouses and five children by two different men, Marcus Agrippa and Tiberius. And after Caligula died, his uncle Claudius married his niece, Caligula's sister Agrippina the Younger. It's just that simple. This very much seems like a rumor that didn't crop up until long after Caligula had died. It was probably made semi-plausible by Caligula's clear affection for his sisters and his public veneration of them, at least before they conspired against him. And isn't it interesting then that Josephus, again writing decades after Caligula died, tells us that it was the allegations of incest that were what first made the public hate Caligula. 
This story is like a game of telephone, stripped of all context and embellished over the years. Not even the most hostile sources say that Caligula made his horse a consul or a senator. They only say that he wished to do so and ended up treating his horse like a senator. Now again, this sounds pretty crazy without any context whatsoever, but if we take a closer look, it's pretty clear what's going on here. It sounds like Caligula gave his horse Incitatus all the trappings and household of a Roman senator. The horse had servants, a grand house, purple blankets, and even hosted luxurious dinners where his admirers could come and flatter him. As satire goes, this was actually a pretty savage takedown of high society life in Caligula's Rome. To put this in context, Caligula didn't set his horse up like a senator until after he'd unveiled the conspiracies against him by the consulars and the senate. As I pointed out before, the office of consul was seen as the crowning achievement for a Roman man during the Republic. But after Augustus, the office of consul was clearly ornamental, although everyone was supposed to pretend otherwise. This is some next level godfather type revenge. Caligula was hammering the point home to the Roman elites and to the general public that these supposedly great men in the Senate were nothing more than pathetic flatterers competing over a pointless bauble, an office that didn't even matter anymore. To become a consul under the emperor simply meant that you were the best brown noser. There is a footnote to this story though. Daiho tells us that Caligula actually made Incitatus a priest. Certain priesthoods in Rome were bought and paid for by the aristocracy as a means of gaining influence and a path of advancement. When Caligula made his horse a priest, he elevated several other men to the priesthood alongside the horse. And Caligula only allowed these men to rise to the priesthood for the extravagant sum of 10 million sesterces. To give you some idea of what kind of amount of money that is, we're told that one of the men that Caligula elevated to the priesthood and made pay for the privilege, privilege, was his uncle Claudius. And the sum that Claudius had to pay at, like bankrupted him. It wiped out his wealth completely. Although again, I should point out here that the sources are once again inconsistent. Suetonius and Dio disagree over even the amount of sesterces that Claudius paid to become a priest. Just imagine being a Roman senator, paying all this money, a literal fortune to become a priest, and then Caligula turns around and makes his horse a priest too. I think it's pretty clear that this isn't an act of madness so much as a cruel and brutal humiliation. I think it's especially interesting that Dio, who is a senator himself, makes no mention of what the Roman public thought of all this. Although I think we can probably make a guess, because Caligula remained popular up until his death, and even for a time afterwards. When Caligula was assassinated, there was a large public outcry, protests, there was rioting, there was unrest. It was a whole thing. So when Caligula named his horse a priest and treated him like a senator, it was clear evidence of a pattern of behavior. But I would argue that pattern of behavior was not madness. It was revenge. And that leads us to our next point. Did Caligula bankrupt the Roman Empire? We're certainly told he did, but how do we then explain the actions of his successor, Claudius? Early in his reign, Claudius lowered taxes, launched a huge military campaign, and set about a whole bunch of expensive building projects. Those are not the actions of an emperor who's working with a depleted treasury. Now, Caligula did attempt to bankrupt the aristocracy and did a fairly good job of it. After his break with the Senate, Caligula compelled the senators to hold lavish dinners and often host the imperial retinue on short notice. And these would have been huge, expensive undertakings. And here Caligula is taking advantage of the Roman hospitality. But imagine being a senator, you couldn't refuse to host the emperor. It would send all sorts of the wrong kind of message. Previously, these sorts of banquets and games had been part of an elaborate competition for social status in Rome, with senators and Roman aristocrats constantly trying to outdo each other. At various points in Rome's history, sumptuary laws had actually been passed in Rome to limit just this kind of spending. But Caligula said all bets were off and actually encouraged the Roman aristocrats to try to outdo themselves again. And it turned into a war of escalation of spending. So wherever possible, Caligula encouraged excess in the imperial court with the purpose of ruining his enemies financially. So did Caligula wish to be a god? More or less, yeah, he did. This one sounds especially crazy to our modern ears, but in the Greco-Roman world, the line between gods and men was blurrier than it is today. In the Roman provinces to the east, there was already a long history of divine kingship. In the eastern Mediterranean, Roman generals and commanders were often already treated in divine terms. Caligula even experienced some of that when his father was traveling around the provinces. And in Greece, there were already hero cults and king cults. And again, using the example of Augustus for context, he had appeared as the god Apollo for different festivals and for banquets. Alexander the Great, whom almost every young Roman boy probably would have idolized in some way, he himself had dressed up like a god and had tried to play up those divine connotations. And when Augustus took over Rome, 
He was offered divine honors, but he refused them. The Romans even allowed for this blurring of boundaries and triumphal processions in which the victorious Roman general rode through Rome in a chariot with all the trappings and costume of a god like Jupiter. Of course, there would be a slave next to the Roman general during the triumph, whispering into his ear and reminding him that he would die someday too, and that he was still just a man. But upon death, it was possible for a mortal man to enter the Roman pantheon. Julius Caesar and Augustus were both deified after they died. This was absolutely unambiguous and was done by formal decree, although there were some jokes and questions about how exactly this practice worked in reality. And just in general, the Roman pantheon of gods was fairly flexible. When the Romans conquered new peoples, they often absorbed their gods into the fold because why not? You don't want to anger those other gods. Why not worship them and sacrifice to them and get some of their power too? And a Roman sacrifice or ritual might include a whole list of gods. And then they would conclude by saying something to the effect of, and oh yeah, this is to all the other gods out there, whoever we might have missed. But there was a clear line. Sacrifices might be made on the behalf of a living emperor, but they weren't made to a living emperor. And this distinction is about to prove very important because Caligula crossed this line and completely broke with the example set for him by Augustus. So in the wake of conspiracy trials and executions, the Senate, in a moment of absolutely excessive flattery, offered Caligula divine honors. Dio says that this was partly out of fear and partly sincere. But in any case, the senators themselves called Caligula God and dedicated a temple to the emperor. So Caligula accepted them at their word. Okay, if I'm a god, well, then you should worship me like one. Rather than insanity, this seems much more like a consolidation of power, a step toward monarchy, a further humiliation of the senators, and some pretty powerful propaganda. There was no mass communication in ancient Rome, but for Caligula to be properly venerated as the god that he now was, there would have to be more images of him, more statues of him, temples built to him all over the empire. Imagine living in the provinces of Rome. You might never see the emperor in person, but you would see his image. You would hear his name mentioned during festivals and sacrifices, rituals. That's an incredible form of power over one's subjects, and in the ancient world was especially effective. There's a reason so many kings depended on the divine right to rule. To go against the emperor's wishes was to go against the gods, and that seems pretty risky when you're a peasant living in the provinces. So for most of the empire, this was acceptable, but not everywhere. So we just saw that the Greco-Roman conceptions of divinity were fundamentally different than the Judeo-Christian ideas about God. And that was before Caligula started pushing the limits and trying to establish divine absolute rule. So how do you think Caligula's ideas about divinity went over in the Jewish communities in the empire in places like Egypt and Syria? In a town not far from Jerusalem, the population was a mixture of Greeks and Jews. The Greeks heard the emperor's new decree and they built an altar to the emperor. In response, members of the Jewish community there tore that altar down. And in response to that, Caligula declared that his statue should be established in the Temple of Jerusalem. Naturally, as word of this decree spread, rioting and unrest followed. But thankfully, the statue had to be made first before it could be put into the Jewish temple. The governor of the province of Syria met with the Jewish population there and asked them to reconsider their refusal. Naturally, the Jews said they could not worship the emperor because they only believed in one god. Previously, the Jews had reached an accommodation under Augustus that, roughly speaking, allowed them to worship as they pleased and make sacrifices to God on behalf of the emperor. When word reached Caligula that there was some resistance to his ideas, he was most likely pretty enraged. One suspects that he might not have seen what the big deal was, just add another God, do as the Romans do. But the bigger problem for Caligula was now a political one. He was in the process of trying to establish absolute rule, and now here was an immediate challenge to his rule. The emperor would have seen this as an affront to his authority. Now, I'm not trying to defend Caligula's policy here, what I'm trying to do is establish that he would have been very angry and that if you were a member of the Jewish community and you're going to visit the emperor on behalf of your people to advocate for your ability to uh, worship as you please, you might be a little scared about what you were going to encounter. You might even fear for your life because you are going into the emperor's palace and you are now going to challenge his authority. Philo of Alexandria went as part of a Jewish delegation to Rome to basically tell the emperor that he was not a god and that they were not going to worship him as a god. So what was Caligula like when Philo actually met him? Well, the mad emperor seems to have been busy sprucing up the palace, giving some directions to servants, and planning for lavish games that he was going to hold. Uh, pretty much standard emperor stuff. In fact, Philo was so stunned by the emperor's politeness that he just assumed that Caligula was going to have him and his fellow ambassadors executed. 
But of course, nothing like that actually happened. Caligula is walking around the palace. He's giving orders. He's almost like a stage director before opening night, trying to get everything ready. And Philo is trying to get a word in edgewise. You can almost imagine the scene there. Philo explains to Caligula that the Jews are happy to make sacrifices on his behalf, but they're not going to make sacrifices to him. Philo here is basically saying, you might say you're a god, the Senate might say you're a god, but we don't agree. So here I am challenging your authority. This is an emperor's new clothes situation, except the emperor is supposedly a brutal, violent psychopath, and the little boy pointing out that the emperor is naked is actually a subject refusing to obey the direct decree of the emperor. Anyways, Caligula jokes about how sacrifices on his behalf do him no good if he is in fact to be a god. He wants the real thing. He wants the sacrifices to be made to him. But the very last thing that Caligula says to Philo is that Caligula decides he doesn't think that the Jews are wicked for disobeying his order or anything. He just says that he thinks they're fools. Philo is naturally offended by this statement, but I don't think Philo recognizes what Caligula was actually doing. By making it into a joke that they're just fools, what Caligula is doing is allowing himself to save face and allowing his visitors an out. Philo has just challenged the emperor's authority in the presence of the imperial retinue, and Caligula is basically letting him off the hook by saying, well, you're not accountable for your actions. So Caligula allows the Jewish ambassadors to go free. Is there any reason to see this as a credit to Caligula, as an act of mercy, benevolence? Actually, there is, because there's mention of an event where Caligula was on stage dressed as a god, and someone in the audience heckled him. And Caligula asked him, what do you see? And the man replied, an idiot. And instead of losing it and having the man executed, Caligula just laughs it off. He's like, well, you're just a cobbler, a common man. I have nothing to fear from you. As Anthony Barrett points out in his biography of Caligula, this seems to be evidence that Caligula didn't take his whole God thing that seriously, or at least not as seriously as the ancient writers took it. In the end, Caligula received a letter from King Herod Agrippa of Palestine. He was a client king of Rome and a personal acquaintance of Caligula. And in that letter, Herod Agrippa gave Caligula some ideas to the chaos and unease that his policy would cause if he continued to force it through. So after getting that letter, Caligula sent a new order to the east, canceling his plans to have his image installed in the temple, and basically rescinding the order to have himself venerated as a god, at least among the Jewish population. This seems like a fairly rational, typical Roman response. Because Caligula also said that in return for him rescinding his order, he would expect the Jewish population not to interfere with the imperial cult anywhere else. Caligula expected the tolerance to be reciprocal, and this was a pretty standard Roman attitude. They generally weren't concerned about the religions of the subject people, so long as they didn't interfere with political life. With that in mind, once Caligula was informed that the Jewish population had threatened an outright insurrection, Caligula then changed the order once more. He would see that it was enforced even if it required a military presence. But of course, before that could happen, Caligula died. You would think a major event like the assassination of a Roman emperor would be relatively easy to pinpoint. But like with so many other parts of Caligula's reign, the details of his assassination are a little fuzzy. Caligula was killed in late January of AD 41 by two tribunes of the Praetorian Guard. Those two men stabbed Caligula to death. There are other stories which include different numbers of assailants, and the conspiracy shrinks or swells depending on which account you're looking at. But it likely happened as Caligula was returning to the palace from an entertainment that he was attending. And shortly after he was killed, his wife and his daughter were also murdered, which suggests that there was probably some fear that the family's popularity would possibly turn the empress into a figure that could have then been rallied around. It's not clear precisely where and when Caligula was killed, nor is the reason why entirely clear either. It's possible that there was a personal reason Supposedly Caligula had made a habit out of regularly insulting one of the tribunes who ended up killing him. A political reason seems more likely though, since after Caligula was dead, there was a brief period where it seemed like the Republic might be restored. There were even some high-flown speeches in the Senate made about Republican virtues and ideals. But Caligula's German bodyguard immediately set about revenge killing several senators and conspirators, and there was a huge public outcry demanding that the perpetrators of the crime be brought to justice. And around Rome, news of Caligula's death was met with a general unrest. And the rest of the Praetorian Guard didn't seem too interested in a return to the Republic. They immediately found Caligula's uncle Claudius and acclaimed him as emperor. It seems like there may have been some resistance from the Senate to this idea, but by that time, Claudius was already safely ensconced in the Praetorian Guard's camp. Soon enough, it was clear that Claudius wasn't backing down. And almost overnight, Caligula's assassins went from heroes 
to criminals. No one in the Senate spoke up on behalf of the two tribunes who had killed Caligula, and shortly thereafter, one of the men committed suicide and the other was executed. I suspect that the two Praetorian tribunes were set up as dupes. They were likely told that they would be Republican heroes in the mold of Amusia Scavola or Horatius, and then once push came to shove, they were hung out to dry. No matter how bad Caligula may have been, there's no way his assassins could think that the next emperor would allow his predecessor's killers to go unpunished. The only way it makes sense is if the assassins assumed that the next emperor would be completely beholden to them, or if they thought there was a chance there might not be a next emperor. Caligula's death and the aftermath were a tangled jumble of conspiracy and intrigues. But whatever the exact nature of the conspiracy, it was complicated by the sentiment of the Roman public who didn't greet Caligula's death with joy. Instead, they were quite distressed by it. But my point here in bringing up Caligula's assassination is that some have pointed to it in and of itself as evidence that the emperor was insane. Since there were so many conspiracies against him, surely some of it must have been justified. In isolation, I think that's reasonable, but as we saw with Tiberius, there was no shortage of conspiracies against him. And no sooner had Caligula become emperor than there were already at least rumors of people plotting his demise. Caligula's successor, Claudius, faced a similar path. After he became emperor, he reconciled with the Senate, only to later on face waves of conspiracies against him. The very same people who had elevated Claudius and been singing his praises then turned against him and worked to hasten his demise. But like Augustus, Claudius seems to have had a better security apparatus than Caligula. Claudius survived for almost 13 years, only to then be possibly poisoned by his own wife. Emperor Nero followed Claudius in AD 54, and after his own conflicts with the senatorial class, he committed suicide in AD 68, at which point Rome then went through three emperors in one year before the fourth, Vespasian, brought a measure of stability to the Roman Empire. To me, that looks more like a systems failure rather than a failure of individual personalities. And I'm not sure that even the noblest philosopher king could have survived the early Roman Empire unscathed, with its amalgam of republican egos and institutions grafted on to the recently established empire. There's a lot more that we could talk about with Caligula and his reign. Even with how long this video is, there was still a lot of material I had to cut, so let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in seeing some of that. But my focus here was on claims and questions of his insanity and tyranny. I think one of the problems with dismissing Caligula as insane is that not only does it seem somewhat unwarranted when we examine the evidence more closely, but it also shuts down critical thinking. Why did Caligula do X or Y? Well, because he was crazy. Why did he implement this policy at that time? Again, because he was crazy. Why was he assassinated? Well, you get the idea. There's no further inquiry necessary if we dismiss Rome's third emperor as a raving madman. But that seems overly simplistic to me, given all the contradictions and questionable claims of our ancient sources. It seems quite possible that Caligula was made out to be an insane person because he was assassinated. And if you were in some way tied to a conspiracy of killing that predecessor, how can you justify your actions without posing a threat to the new emperor and thus bringing some unwanted attention and scrutiny upon yourself? It seems to me that Caligula's so-called insanity is a convenient explanation that solves a lot of problems for a number of very powerful people in ancient Rome. And it seems very curious to me that only after Caligula was dead, his successor was firmly established, and claims of his insanity were being thrown about seriously, then do we see a whole wave of members of the senatorial class trying to claim glory by associating themselves with the conspiracy that killed the insane tyrant. And when evaluating Caligula and his reign, we should never forget that our sources inhabited a tiny world of elites. They weren't writing for popular consumption. They were writing for a narrow audience that was much like themselves in background, class, wealth, and status. So what they wrote only needed to be acceptable to a small number of mostly wealthy aristocrats. The ancient writers show little regard for the feelings of the public. And when they do talk about the feelings of the Roman public, it's generally with a sense of scorn and disregard. If those people like the emperor, it must be because they're stupid or foolish. How do we define a decent ruler? By the feelings of the aristocracy or by the feelings of the masses? Are the opinions of a wealthy minority more valid than that of the majority? I've gone on more than long enough. I'm gonna rest my case right there and I'm gonna leave it to you. Make up your own mind and let me know in the comments what you think. Was Caligula an insane tyrant? Was he the victim of bad PR? Does the truth lie somewhere in between? If you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two about Caligula, please hit that like button so we can share our passion and excitement for ancient history with even more people. My name is Jay, and I'll see you next time.